Hey, I'm excited to be with you today. I'm your host, Pastor Asa Dockery, and this is the conclusion of the message we began last week entitled, The Power of Faith. Faith has the power to move mountains. It may not just be physical things in our life, but spiritual mountains also. Doubt, unbelief, fear, worry. We can overcome those things when we speak at our mouth what is spoken, what is declared in the Word of God. I don't want to preach to you right now. I want you to sit back and enjoy this Word. Let it minister to your heart as we conclude last week's message entitled, The Power of Faith. If His thoughts are above our thoughts and and our ways are not His ways, then how can we understand God? Faith. Faith gives us understanding to know the ways of God. Moses knew the ways of God according to Psalm 103, right? Faith gave him the ability. He believed God when God spoke to him. God said it. Abraham believed it. It was counted unto Abraham as righteousness, right? Faith gave uh, Moses and Abraham the ability to understand, to perceive, and to know the ways of God or how he operates. Now, if a person doesn't operate by faith, then they won't understand why God instructs us to do the things that seems to be strange to our carnal way of thinking. Right? God ever told you to do something, and and you thought, no, that's not God, that's the devil. He's trying to humiliate me. Joyce Meyer was going to, I believe it was China, and she had uh, luggage, this is back in the old days, she had luggage that was filled with Bibles. You do that, and in China, they find you a, a quick way to the grave, or at least to the prison. And so she was getting up to the baggage claim, and the people are, are uh, getting ready to go through her stuff. And, and uh, the Lord says, Joyce, get down on your knees and crawl through. <laughs> do what? Get down on your knees and crawl through. And she, she just couldn't understand why God couldn't understand. Sometimes to, to, to understand God, you first have to believe it is God, and then you have to accept it as God's will, and then he'll give you the grace to do it without the understanding of why. So what she does is she gets down on the floor, and she starts crawling through security. They look down there, down there at her. Here's this well-known evangelist crawling on her knees through security, and while she's crawling through, her luggage is going through the scanner. The, 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 uh, the guards are watching her and laughing, and they're distracted by her, and the luggage gets through unscathed. And Bibles get into China. See, it doesn't make sense to the carnal mind, but if you'll just trust God and obey Him without knowing why, God will give you the understanding after you do it. Right? So she obeyed God and got the Bibles in there. Now, having said that, go to Matthew 1. Faith gives you power to trust God until you get understanding of why God asked you to do things a certain way. This is where the body of Christ really needs revelation because we're too much like Thomas. If you'll do this, God, then I will believe. If you'll do this, then I will obey. If you do this, then I will give. God says, if I tell you to do it, do it without me giving you the reason why, and if you'll do it by faith, I'll give you the grace to do it without knowing why, and then afterwards, I will reveal to you why I did it that way. Now, God has a plan here in Matthew. (coughs) He's been prophesied about all through the, the law and the prophets that he's going to send Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, Emmanuel, to earth, and through him the world can be saved. Now, how he does that is not really fully revealed in the Old Testament until you get to about Isaiah. Now, here in Matthew 1 and 18, let's pick it up. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed, uh, engaged to Joseph, before they came together, in other words, before they had sex, She was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Now, wait a minute. They just said before they came together, 
she has a child. She's now conceived of the Holy Spirit. Joseph catches wind of this. She's gone out and got her pregnancy test and comes back and it's positive. Right, row, row, Roy, we've got a problem. Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. Did Joseph believe her story about her being pregnant by the Holy Spirit? No. Woman, you did what? The holy who? Yeah, okay. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, well, you know who I am. Who are you? Do not be afraid to take, your, uh, take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. He got a revelation. But would he believe what he just heard? And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled that was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph, say then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did, did, as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took to him his wife, and did not know uh, her till she had brought forth uh, her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Joseph did not believe Mary when she told him that her baby was conceived by the Spirit of God. Let me ask you this question, guys. Would you have believed if you were him and no one had ever heard of such a thing? It'd be hard to believe, wouldn't it? That'd be a, a, a tall order to swallow. It wasn't until after he had an encounter with God that Joseph believed Mary's story. Before faith, Joseph saw Mary as a cheater. But after faith filled his heart, he saw Mary as a virgin mother of God's Son. Isn't that awesome? Faith. Without faith, she's a loose woman. She betrays his trust, his vow, celibacy before marriage, coveted to Joseph. Till death do we part. But without faith, she's a cheater. But once he, he heard God say, the angel of the Lord say, she, that thing that she has in her womb is conceived of the Holy Spirit. He is holy and he is the Son of the living God. When he heard that, he chose to believe it. Don't you know, it, it took a, a moment or two for him to let that go. I, I believe that she cheated. I mean, I really believed it because she's pregnant. Now I've got to let go of that to embrace this. How many of us are struggling right now because we believe this about God or this about a situation, but God is telling us this about it? And it's hard to let go of that so that you can embrace this. And yet he did it. And when he did it, God gave him understanding as to how a virgin can become pregnant without the seed of a man. Wow. Now, even though faith gives us understanding to see how God can do something that is supernatural, we still have to step out in faith before the miracle can take place in our lives. Faith helps us to step out. Turn with me to Acts 26. I'm going to give you a couple of examples. One of a non-believer and one of a believer. Acts 26. Is this happening to today? 26, verse 21.
Paul has been brought to Rome and is brought before uh, King Agrippa, uh, trumped up charges they brought against him, trying to get him put in prison or better yet, killed. And so he's getting to testify about the charges leveled against him. And while he's testifying about his own case, he starts pleading the case of Christ with King Agrippa. He fits his faith testimony in with his testimony on his own uh, merits. So let's pick it up in verse 21. For these reasons the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. Therefore, having obtained help from God, to this day I stand witnessing both to small and great, saying no other things than those which the prophets and Moses said would come, that the Christ should suffer, that he would be the first to rise from the dead, and would proclaim light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. Now, as he uh, thus made the, his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are beside yourself. Much learning is driving you mad. But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus. See, he did not lose his respect for Festus, even though Festus said he was an insane guy. But speak the words of truth and reason. For the king, before whom I also speak freely, knows these things, for I am convinced that none of these things escapes his attention since this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. Then Agrippa said to Paul, You almost persuade me to become a Christian. Paul goes on and said, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today might become both almost and altogether such as I am, except for these chains. Now, even though Paul almost convinced the king to believe in Jesus, he chose not to believe at least for that moment. He had Paul had given King Agrippa credible evidence, had talked about how the prophecies and the prophets had foretold about Christ, about his suffering, and he was sure that King Agrippa had heard all about Jesus and how he was crucified, and now Paul is witnessing to him with all this credible evidence, and it, it causes King Agrippa to even to consider Jesus as the Christ and his personal Savior. Through this story, we see that in order to come to faith, faith, we must first have sufficient evidence before we believe it. Right? If, if somebody is going to sell you a car, you're going to be apprehensive about that car because you don't know the history of that car. Or if it's a new car, you may not know the history of the dealer who's selling you that car. You will have to be convinced, talked into, buying that car. Paul uses that same method to convince Agrippa to believe in Christ. Now, <clears throat> in order for us to come to faith, there has to first be sufficient evidence before we will fully believe it. Now, when we say we believe in something, we believe up to the point that we are able to trust. So if I don't have full sufficient evidence that speaks directly to my heart, I, I will say I believe, but I only believe as much as I trust you. Right? And then as they prove themselves faithful to what they have told me, then I can trust them even more. The same goes with Christ. He may have shown me these things. He may have to told me these things. But though I believed on these things, I do not yet know him. Therefore, I can only trust him as far as I believe in him. So he has to work with me in that. That's what King Agrippa was doing. Amen? Now, <clears throat> through this, uh, we see that King Agrippa did not at that time receive Christ. Nevertheless, like the Jews who died in the wilderness, like we read in Hebrews 3, uh, who died in the wilderness because they refused to be, believe God after 40 years of miracles and evidence. There will be some who will have sufficient evidence to validate that God's word is in fact true to them, but they will choose to walk away from that truth. That's sad, isn't it? Had sufficient evidence, had collabor collaboration through the prophets, and yet, he chose, almost persuaded, 
He chose not to. That's sad. Now turn with me to Acts 16. So when you witness to people, you don't know whether or not they're going to receive it, but you still have a, a responsibility to share your faith with them, correct? Acts 16 talks about where Paul and Silas has uh, been praying and they've been ministering for days and this girl, young woman uh, with the spirit of divination has been following them and Paul turns around out of uh, frustration and casts the demon out of that girl and she is saved and her uh, money makers who used her gift to get wealth had him cast into prison because they were turning the city upside down. So while they're in the prison they began having a, a praise worship uh, session. So look at verse 25. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's chains were loosed. Now that's a Holy Ghost party, right? The doors of the prisons were opened up, and all the chains of the prisoners fell off of them. And the keeper of the prison, awaking from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. And Paul called out with a loud voice, saying, Do, not, or do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light, ran in, and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now this is a total different scenario than what we saw there with King Agrippa, right? Something has so gotten a hold of this jailer's heart that he knows, hey, I've heard a lot about you guys. We know what, what's been going on here in Jerusalem. We know why you're in here in jail. You cast a demon out of a girl, and now she's sane and she's up in her right mind. We know all these things. And so all this stuff starts clicking whenever he sees uh, that there's been an earthquake. All the doors are open and all the chains are off, but yet all the prisoners stay there. He comes up to Paul and Silas and say, Guys, what must I do to be saved? Wow. So they said, what? Believe. Believe on who? The Lord Jesus Christ. And you will be what? Saved. Not only you, but your, your whole household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he said, uh, and he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and all his family were baptized. Wow. Isn't that something? He and his whole family were saved and baptized that night. What, what's the difference between King Agrippa and this jailer? Let me give you a scripture. Jesus said in Matthew 18 that unless we be converted and become as little children, we shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. What is it about little children that gives them access into the kingdom? Children have an innocence about them that simply trust what people say. We do. <laughs> See how I slipped that in there? <laughs> Almost pulled it off. Little children simply take people at their word. That's why you have to warn children. When somebody says they're going to take you and go get you ice cream, don't believe them. There's an innocence there. Jesus says we've got to become that, like that little child that believes. You know what happens? What happens to children where they lose their innocence is when uh, they've been hurt and disappointed by people they loved and believed in because they either lied to them or they did not keep their word. So they learned through those hardships not to trust so easily. We have to be... Isn't that, it's weird. It's a dichotomy. We're born innocent in that we will trust anybody, but at the same time, nobody has to teach us to do wrong. We do wrong automatically, but then we have to be taught not to trust people. That is weird, isn't it? We have a clear conscience as, as babies, as babies, 
as children, but yet we have a demic nature that wants to get us in trouble. It's weird. But once we start having people wrong us, lie to us, deceive us, it teaches us not to trust them. Then we become cynical of people. I don't believe you. You're nothing but a hypocrite. Cynicism, right? Cynicism is caused by Satan because it takes away our innocence that would believe Jesus without any challenge. And so God has to deal with that cynicism, that hardness of heart, because we have been wronged by man so that we can believe in Jesus, who is a holy man. Now, when this jailer heard this, he believed the words of Paul and Silas and became brand new because he had that heart as a child. But King Agrippa was more cynical. Now turn with me to John, 1 John 5 and we're done. This is where we're, he's taking us right now to finish this up. You know, if we would just believe it, all things are possible today. That's his word. If you will believe it, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. If God be for us, who can be against us? But we have to believe it. It's not hard to believe. It's hard to overcome the unbelief. That's why the father with the guy, the kid that was throwing himself in the fire, he says, I believe, God, Jesus, that you'll heal, that you can heal. I just have problems with my unbelief. Help thou my unbelief. 1 John 5, 1, we're done. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is what? Born of God. And everyone who loves him, who begot, also loves him who is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever... Whatever is born of God, what? Overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcome the world, that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. The more we believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the more we will overcome. Yes, the weapons will be formed, but they won't prosper. Faith in God, faith in His Son, faith in His Word gives us power to become His children. Faith also gives us power. That's what the sermon's about today, right? The power of faith. Faith also gives us power to overcome fear, bondages, and addiction. You just got to face them in the power of faith. Don't run from it. Don't hide your addiction. Don't hide these things from God. Let him know it. God, I've got this. I'm born again, but I have this problem, right? The problem with Christians is we don't want to be honest with God. We want to be like Adam and Eve and hide ourselves, hide our issues. But God says, I've given you faith, and without faith you can't please me. It's not your bondages that is, that is uh, kicking me off, God says. It is your, your fear. I don't have a problem with your sin if you'll confess it to me. I'm not going to be heartbroken over it. I already know you have it. It's just that you're afraid to admit it to me so I can deal with it. Come on, somebody help me up there. In order for faith to work in your life and my life, uh, we will have to believe God more than, we're, uh, more than what we're fighting or facing in this physical realm. Your belief in God has to exceed your fear or what you're facing in this natural realm. So, will you release the power of faith to save you or to set you free today? The choice is yours. You can walk out of this building a completely different person. Now faith is. Stand to your feet. Lydia. We as Christians in this modern world we're living have to overcome cynicism and unbelief. We've, especially in charismatic circles, full gospel, spirit-filled circles, 
we have to overcome the spirit of cynicism and unbelief. Well, I tried to believe once and it failed. If I were to preach this in Africa or somewhere where the gospel is not prevalent and promise them salvation from false gods and to have eternal life with the living God. If I were to tell them that they could be healed of uh, diseases caused by immorality and delivered of demons caused by voodoo worship, they would flock to the altars. But in America, you can tell people that and they just stand there. Cynicism. But what you may not know is this may be the day that your faith breaks through that stronghold. It's not God who's keeping it from you because that goes, from, that goes against Scripture. God says, I will withhold no good thing from those that walk uprightly before me. So what is it that's keeping me from my miracle, my deliverance, my breakthrough? That stronghold in your mind. I don't think I'll get it. If you don't think you'll get it, then you won't. You've got to believe in your heart that you will and you shall have whatever you ask. I pray this word has been a, a powerful blessing in your life. Isn't it amazing how something as small as a grain of mustard seed can move a mountain out of your life, out of your way, so that you can fulfill your destiny and purpose in Christ? It's amazing what the Holy Spirit brings out of the Word of God week after week. And we're so glad you're a part of this ministry. And we, we want to encourage you, if you have any prayer requests, any needs in your life, will you contact us at prayer at whcnorth.org. And our intercessors and myself are agreeing in prayer that God will move in your life and move these situations that are adverse to your faith so that you can see a turnaround and see the blessings of God take its place. So before I leave you, I want to encourage you. We're looking for Kingdom Builder partners that will stand with us financially. $20 a month, $10 a month. If we had 100 partners that would sign up with us, we would be able to take this voice to so many more places. We're already reaching many nations in the world through our outlets on the Internet and on television. But it's time to expand, and we need your support to help us carry this load. We've been doing this for almost five years. I've never really asked for partners, but today I'm asking you to consider becoming a, build, a Kingdom Builder partner. So if you do that, would you contact me? Uh, you can do that at the email at whcnorth.org, and uh, you'll see the information on the bottom of the screen. If you want to find out more about this ministry and what we're about and our, our core values and our beliefs, you can go on our website at whcnorth.org. And there you can find out all the information you would like to know. Thank you once again for tuning in. This is your host, Pastor Rachel Dockery, praying God's blessings upon your life. In Jesus' name. We pray that you've been impacted by today's message. If you need more information or would like to contact us, visit us on our website at whcnorth.org or contact us by phone at 706-374-6175. To write us, our address is P.O. Box 968, Morganton, Georgia, 30560. Our campus is located at 135 Bud Franklin Drive, Blairsville, Georgia, 30512.